Good morning. You're all very welcome. This is Visioning the Future, Artistic Doctorates in Ireland. This is our online seminar series and we are very excited to welcome you this morning to the final session on our first section of the seminar series, um, which is, has been focused on the European context. So just to say, um, I am Jules Gilson. I'm Professor of Creative Practice at UCC, and I'm also Head of the School of Film, Music and Theatre, and I'm directing this research project along with a great deal of my uh, fantastic colleagues, both at University College Cork and nationally. Um, so today, also just to say that this session is being recorded and that all, all of the sessions are being archived on our website. So you can look there at the previous sessions if you've missed any, and that's a great resource. And we've also got additional resources there. So um, this final um, part seminar is really going to be focused on a round table and uh, a focus on reflecting on what we've done so far and the presentations that we've had so far. So we've had presentations on the artistic doctorate in Europe from Paolo de Assis, who was from the Orpheus Institute in Ghent, focused on music. From Annette Arlanda from the University of the Arts in Helsinki on performance and theatre. From Andrea Bright from the University of Vienna on film. And from Vida Migelo on Tuesday this week from Middlesex University on dance and movement practices. We've also had um, a, a wonderful overview of national advocacy and supports for the artistic doctorate in France from Gretchen Schiller from the University of Grenoble Alps. So this seminar then um, uh, looks at all of those seminars and um, works with colleagues both from UCC and nationally to reflect on each of those seminars um, and to look at the discipline specific um, issues related to the artistic doctorate PhD but also to look at how we in Ireland might use these insights to develop national advocacy and a national um, support um, program. So this research, um, Envisioning the Future Artistic Doctorates in Ireland, is focused specifically on the disciplines of dance, music, film and theatre. And in Ireland, we have 11 third level institutions who are currently offering practice based or artistic research uh, doctorates in these areas. And that represents the majority of our um, uh, third level institutions. Um, and so we are a small country, but we have a big commitment to these kinds of programs, but we are at a beginning stage of trying to coordinate how we think about those. So without further ado, I'm going to post, pass over to Inesh Bentoquello, who is our postdoctoral researcher. Thank you, Inesh. Thank you, Jules, and welcome everyone. So throughout part one of the seminar series, we had the opportunity to think about what artistic research is and how the field is currently expanding in Europe. So I'm just going to share a couple of thoughts here in terms of what the discussion has been around artistic research. At the very introduction seminar, uh, my colleague Trina Nikiohon talked about how artistic research provides a space that has a huge potential to both think about and unsettle what the narratives are of what is an artistic work, whether that's written, performed, um, and so on, and how that might be framed within an academic context, but also creating space for voices that might otherwise not have a space to flourish as well. Yvonne Bonenfant spoke about artistic research as a space that is currently developing and how it is important to keep that development alive rather than thinking about how we might crystallize it as it is the case with several other uh, methodological discourses. Annette Arlander mapped out several tensions and polarities around artistic research and spoke about how those tensions and polarities are indeed necessary and spoke about artistic research as an arena for those tensions to coexist. And then Andrea Brett, speaking about film, talked about the challenges of understanding what is the space that artistic research in film occupies, as film is often used not only for documentation and dissemination, and those that might hide the potential of film of expanding and delving into knowledge production. So that creates uh, challenges in terms of understanding uh, that context and the clarity of that context. 
follow the seas talking about music very clearly outline how artistic practice deals with sensation and academic research focus on making sense of what we experience and he proposes an understanding of artistic research as the concept of experimental machine which integrates the practice and the academic within an experiment with an experimental uh, view and finally, our last session, Vida Michelow talked about tensions, the ongoing tension between artistic research and academia, and how artistic research might be a tool to shift our thinking and practice um, towards how we might, as artists, as practitioners, make an impact in society. She also spoke about the importance of bridging and building connections to um, art organizations. So I just wanted to open up with some initial thoughts on what artistic research is. There were also many conversations around supervision, examination, and the role of practice in writing. But for now, I would like to pass over to my colleague, Trina Neoklun Hoyne, who is going to speak about artistic research in music and particularly about the presentation from Polo Diocese. Trina is head of music and at UCC, and I'll pass over to you, Trina. Thank you very much, uh, Inesh, for that. Um, so just my, my thoughts um, on uh, Paolo de Assis's uh, presentation. It was an incredibly rich presentation um, that covered many aspects of artistic research within the field of music and central to his conceptualization, as you've already touched upon, um, similar to the idea of the, the generator of experimental machines um, and so forth, was bringing together artistic practice and uh, research or actually maybe problematizing the dichotomy between those those two things and in my own field i specialize in music most particularly in the traditional arts as well and this was very resonant um, with with my own experience as well the idea of generating a space where um, voices that maybe we don't hear about or knowledges that are in some way disqualified or uh, are subjugated can actually uh, come to the fore. Uh, and so I found that hugely engaging. In addition, he also shared with us a very practical framework for artistic research within music and also suggested, which was very interesting, that sometimes one could possibly argue that some forms of, of creative practice um, PhDs aren't necessarily artistic research and he spoke a lot about this tension between writing about and doing creative practice and I think that's key to much of our discussions and, and how we conceptualize artistic research uh, more generally. I think within an Irish context that proposal actually has huge potential because I can see across a range of subgenres within music, how this could be incredibly um, fruitful for people. So that, for example, I can see a place for scholar performers, particularly coming out of this, and that that artistic research actually will create a new paradigm for people who are embarking on a doctorate, so that people no longer feel um, that they have to objectify their own creative practice. Um, in order to um, gain a PhD and they move more towards the experiential and the experiential knowledges that actually come out of creative practice. And so for me, a lot of what um, Paula Diocese had to say really resonated with many of the other speakers as well uh, when they were talking about like Paolo, one of the, the, my favorite phrase that the Paolo Diocese shared with us was problematicity. And he was saying that this is at the key of artistic research. Um, and I think, I suppose, before I finish up, because I'm conscious of time, in, in relation to the traditional arts, I also see in the Irish context huge potential, um, both within music and in other fields as well, um, for us creating this new space for traditional artists. And of course, there already have been uh, creative practice doctorates in traditional arts uh, in Ireland. But I think that the discussions so far have now maybe tested how we conceptualize those. And one of the things that came up was um, how might a traditional artist be different from somebody who has um, a very strong um, identity with, you know, very modern subjectivity or a sense of the avant-garde and how 
how would the traditional artist possibly be different from that? And so artistic research kind of creates um, this space whereby there can be other subjectivities brought to play in artistic research, possibly in, in a very practical sense, fusing field research, fusing archival research, going beyond the sense of, you know, Norbert Elias's windowless monad, going beyond the sense of the individual themselves, and actually um, conceiving of artistic research processes um, that are multivocal or have a multiplicity of knowledges by bringing other people together. So I think that's something um, that, has, that has come out of this for me. And I'm really excited about how we will manage to develop these paradigms for artistic research in Ireland. And I think that we will be able to do so in a way that actually opens up what we understand as both creative knowledges and intellectual knowledges as well, and how we're going to progress from there. So I, I leave it at that because I'm conscious of time. And um, I forgot, my apologies. And I'm also to introduce uh, Yvonne Bonafon, who's the, the head of theatre, um, who will talk about um, uh, theatre and performance um, within artistic research, and he will respond uh, directly to the presentation of Annette Arlander. My apologies, Yvonne. Hi, everyone. Um, this wasn't my first time listening to Annette speak, uh, and I was reminded of um, what I enjoy so much about Annette's way of presenting, which is a really interesting combination of playfulness and rigor, um, and uh, insistence on alternative forms of rigor that I really enjoyed. So I'm grateful to have been able to assist at that presentation. Uh, Annette's presentation sketched out four core tensions. Rather than focus on those four tensions, um, I'm going to reiterate some of them and just list some of the key issues I thought Annette threw up in, uh, in her presentation with regards to theater and performance. First of all, um, she pointed out that the theatrical or what's construed as the theatrical or the dramatic exists on this spectrum that runs from live and performance art practices right through to show business. And that some of the tensions involved in working uh, in the domain are precisely because the pressures on artists and artist researchers are really different depending on which parts of those spectrum they're engaging with. Secondly, she raised a tension between methodologies, methodological approaches, a kind of conservatory style continental, what's emerged as a continental conservatory style conception of artistic research where methodology is derived from the creative practice rather than a more traditional Anglosphere model of research where methodology is used to justify the fact that creative practice appears in the PhD at all. Um, so there's that an interesting tension there between how we develop methodological discourse. Um, thirdly, she raised the issue of authorship and the complexity of the notion of authorship when examining PhDs in theatrical practice. Anybody doing something on a stage is rarely doing it alone. So there is a kind of team ranging from the very small to the, rain, to the very large that is having a dramatic impact on creative choices made. So um, in terms of, you know, deciding what a research is being pursued and articulating that research, it can be very challenging to specify the authorial role of an individual research, a researcher inside of a large creative project. Thirdly, um, there is the tension between uh, uh, aesthetic achievement uh, and uh, the need for a final project to uh, work as an aesthetic product when it is practice-based and the, the uh, virtuosic nature of the theorization that might be expected alongside. So we might talk about tensions between overtly performative uh, embodied virtuosities on stage and the kind of virtuosity required um, by traditional ac academic systems in articulating theoretical frameworks around that virtuosity. Um, and that raised the notion of skill, that really interesting, we might call it a chestnut, that raises its head over and over again in theatrical 
PhDs, which is how good do people have to be at it if they're experimenting? Um, and how is the skill level that people achieve either as composer makers or as performers assessed and evaluated when that might be the very thing someone is experimenting with, which leads us on to the notion of failure and experimentation. Um, there is so much performative pressure in the theatrical domain to end off with an end product that in some way articulates its aesthetic virtuosity or its workshop-based practice virtuosity. We might go backwards into the uh, Diasis's notion of problematicity and think, but wait, if someone's trying to invent a virtuosity or invent a new kind of virtuosity, must it match the criteria of show business in order to be validated, or on the other hand, of the white cube gallery system in order to be validated on a more performance or live art level. Um, so that was an interesting one. Uh, some final issues she raised. We in the performative fields are stuck with audience and in a way that other domains often are not. Often audience response or audience engagement forms a core part of the arguments being made inside a PhD. We're working with a level of performative interdisciplinarity that's unusual. And finally, um, I will raise this interesting specter uh, of, um, that's my timer, raise my interesting, the interesting specter of conservatism. And one of the things that I, took away so refreshingly from Annette's presentation was her reminder that not only can academia be conservative, but so can art. And so one of the roles the PhD can play in the theater and performance sphere is actually to challenge both of those domains. It's not always art challenging academia. It can go in both directions. Um, thanks. I now pass on to my colleague and the head of department of film and screen media at UCC, Kira Chambers, um, who is going to be uh, discussing the presentation by Andrea Bright on artistic research in film. Thanks Yvonne. Um, so for the seminar on film, as Yvonne mentioned, we were lucky to have with us Andrea Bright from the University of Vienna who has been involved in an artistic research group that was responsible for producing a seminal document, the Florence Principles on Artistic Doctorates. So it was really useful to have her expertise um, and to raise many questions that are pertinent to the area of film practice. So the, fem the, the seminar focused on the various forms that academic screen practice can take. And we saw examples of how creative practice can challenge the traditional conventions of filmmaking um, and also embody within the creative practice element significant explorations of politics and ideology. So we discussed as well some of the ways that academia can interact with industry and that pursuing creative practice is actually quite liberating for filmmakers who are used to working within commercial constraints, particularly if they're working in traditional film or broadcast structures. It's important too that academic research feeds back into industry, highlighting inequities in production culture, highlighting um, stereotyping and creative representation, and reminding broadcasters, funders, policymakers that screen production is a hugely important part of our culture, shared part of our culture, and it also has significant potential for education as well as entertainment. And I think that's an area that's often overlooked. In relation to the Irish context, it's important to remember that film is not just about mainstream Hollywood. And in fact, academic screen practice in particular can so often focus on and highlight alternative modes of production and alternative modes of creative expression. So we have a spectrum too, um, a bit like the one Yvonne just mentioned, that, that really spans quite a, a vast range of activity from mainstream broadcasting through to artistic and experimental forms that may involve um, video installation and gallery work. So creative practice in film and academia can sometimes highlight these marginalized forms and, and make them visible to audience. Is not of bringing those more, more marginalized forms to the general public as well as to academic audiences. Um, <clears throat> 
there's another kind of important area, of, I suppose, of, of discussion here, and, and that relates to academic standards and ensuring that film is clear and confident in academic screen practice in articulating its contribution to knowledge and maintaining those rigorous academic standards. And part of this relates to the PhD supervision process. So the supervision process is something that embodies so much more than just the direction of a student towards the creation of an artistic portfolio and a thesis. In, in many ways, it's like a professional apprenticeship and a good supervisor will guide the student through all the processes that they need to successfully negotiate the, the difficulties and challenges of academia. So that's in terms of writing a research paper and um, finding a theoretical framework for their artistic practice, negotiating the conference circuit, presenting with confidence uh, at conferences, and dealing with the interrogation of their topic and their methodology that will inevitably occur, and dealing with some of the challenges around that. So this is about preparing the candidate for survival in the world of academia. And this is quite a lengthy process of mentorship. And it carries a different meaning when it's creative practice that's um, the, the subject of the supervision. So it's quite possible for supervisors to forget that academia is quite a mysterious and different space than, than the creative industries. Um, we might assume that an experienced and acclaimed artist has negotiated all the hierarchies and politics of the creative industries and therefore will not find academia a problem, but academia is a space that has its own idiosyncrasies. So I think it's important for supervisors to reflect on how they approach the supervision of creative practice differently, especially when they're dealing with people who are already esteemed and acclaimed in their field. This is a, a way in which as well that there can be a symbiotic learning process and, and every PhD supervision should be a symbiotic process where the candidate teaches the supervisor as well. And I think with creative practice, this is a really exciting way of interacting with um, the creative world whereby the candidate brings back into academia some of the excitement uh, about artistic expression and, and, and some of the, the focus on finding new ways of learning and new um, interdisciplinary approaches that are, are mutually, mutually beneficial for academia and industry when it comes to filmmaking. So there are possibilities there of, of, of forming new links and, and maybe inspiring new modes of, of mutually beneficial research for both fields. So a forum like this, Visioning the Future, gives us a chance to reflect on all of this context and helps us to ensure that we're going to give our PhD students a good experience um, and ensuring that the work they produce is of the highest academic and artistic standards. So at this point, um, I'll hand over to Jenny Roach, the current coordinator of the PhD in Arts Practice and the MA in Contemporary Dance Performance at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick. And Jenny will be reflecting on Vera Midgelow's presentation on dance. Thanks very much, Kira. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I was really delighted to have been asked to um, uh, interconnect with, with Vida and to um, facilitate that session. Um, and one of the main areas that she was talking about was her Erasmus Plus Artistic Doctorates in Europe project, which is a really exciting and extensive project that, we, that has involved a huge amount of consultation throughout Europe with uh, different modes and forms of undertaking artistic doctorates. It also provides a real um, resource for researchers and supervisors alike. And, to, and I, I know Jules has said that it's inspired as well, this, this project, Visioning the Future. So um, I suppose some of the, the key areas that she discussed that I also found very resonant um, and also in relation to the Irish context um, were to do, one of the things we she talked about was uh, plurality and access um, to research. And I guess that's also how we open up the, the, as, as Kira was talking about, these kind of mysterious spaces of academia for artists to inhabit and inhabit in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, produce this, this huge sense of de-skilling and disconnect and, and lack of context. And I think that's really significant. Um, and one of the, the key questions I would be always encountering is how we decolonize our curriculum in that way as well and move beyond kind of Western philosophical uh, approaches and epistemological frameworks. And, uh, and, and beyond the notion of justifying our artistic research constantly through other, other kind of forms. Um, in dance that has really shifted in num the last number of years where we're finding less need to use other um, art forms or philosophical traditions to, um, to justify what it is that we do because actually there's more and more dance writing which is really 
wonderful um, from practitioners, and that has made a huge difference to the field. Um, we talked a bit about uh, the, how artists are supported to enter into academia um, and how we kind of, you know, uh, through research training, uh, uh, support that. And again, talked a little bit about studio practice and how, um, you know, research training can take place in the studio. This is one thing I'm really passionate about. I was very lucky myself to have encountered that because my own supervisor was a, a choreographer. And, um, but I still find that still relatively unusual to, to undertake um, that kind of, of, of training. And yet, um, when I teach in that, in that area, it's, it's incredibly enriching and allows, I suppose, a kind, another way of interacting and interconnecting with knowledge and um, ideas and documentation and archiving and process around that. So um, I think that this is something I mean, I wondered as well, it does, has dance really contributed um, quite significantly to this area because of our relationship to somatic inquiry and how, you know, the body is always, is always foregrounded in that way. So our research, we kind of naturally come up against these kind of conflicts and these, these issues. And um, so uh, there have been some wonderful resources in the last number of years um, that have really explored this idea around somatic um, researching and um, so I think that this is a really wonderful area and it seemed to come across really strongly in, in Vida's presentation how dance had really contributed to that field. Um, we talked, she talked a little bit about uh, reaching communities and, and participating in world issues which is also really important and um, there's often a sense in, in arts practice that there's a certain kind of perhaps elitism or disconnect from the everyday and of course um, and I, I think what Kira was talking about as well preparing researchers for the potential to be, you know, practitioner scholars that can apply for funding to do projects that will have absolute impact and connection into their communities. And I think, you know, modeling that kind of career possibility is, is, is really important for researchers and supervisors in that way um, can, can really do that by, by opening up the potential um, to, to, to see yourself as a scholar practitioner and how you might actually have a place within academia coming from an artistic practice and still maintaining an artistic practice, which would be um, really ideal. So, um, yeah, I think the, we talked also about the supervisory process. She was talking about that and how, you can, how that might be enhanced and um, a further kind of training in that area. And it is true, it's quite a complex area to... Um, I think it's, it's quite a complex area to um, to navigate uh, supervision in that in that field. So I think um, this was something that she was also um, talking about um, how we prepare people to to engage in that way. So um, it was yeah again a very very rich um, encounter and also really um, exciting to see the potential for dance to have made a big contribution in that field. So I think because of time, I'm going to now pass over to the, my next person. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, Nicholas Johnston, who's the Associate Professor of Drama at Trinity College Dublin and a member of IMBAS, the Irish Advocacy Organisation for Artistic Research. And he's going to speak about national support for artistic research for PhDs in Ireland and the presentation by Gretchen Schiller. Thank you. So I'm just going to come in there because, oh, Nick is here. Hi, Nick. I'm going to pass over to you. We lost you there. Are you there now, Nick? I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay, sorry, I just lost power there for a moment and then plugged back in. Um, so, uh, sorry, I just uh, stepped on the very end, I'm sure, of, uh, of the introduction there. So, uh, like my colleagues, I'm just going to try to, to distill, I suppose, what um, Professor Gretchen Schiller was bringing to this conversation, I guess with an eye toward Ireland and the point that we find ourselves at here with artistic doctorates. So uh, while her focus in the presentation was on, on France specifically, she herself brings a wealth of international experience um, with an academic background that includes uh, Canadian, US and UK contexts. And her presentation unfolded across three different parts. Um, she spoke first about the national level in France. Um, the advocacy that she's part of there is an organization called ResCam, um, which is the Réseau Création Art et Media, um, an organization that includes 18 universities there. So, um, a slightly larger scale than the 11 that we're looking at here, but still um, a, a kind of nationwide organization is developing uh, some key points. So some of the really useful material, I think, for us to draw on is in uh, the resources provided by that organization, 
um, her listed points about the issues that they have dealt with and the advice and the advocacy they've come up with at national level. Um, the second area of discussion was what is going on in Grenoble specifically um, at, at her university, the Université Grenoble Alpes, and the methodological issues were kind of the third. So what seems to arise repeatedly um, from her experience of artistic doctorates at all levels, um, including, I thought, very usefully her experience as an examiner, um, what she had seen uh, as a PhD examiner in lots of those cases. So I think um, the first really key takeaway for me was um, this point she made early on when she said that, that these guidelines always need to be geographically specific, yet also international. And I think that's an important dialectic that's in operation here, that these, these multiple levels, the flexibility of an artistic doctorate that bonds us to international best practice and the European community and recognizing that that kind of bond is essential for the, the funding models that exist that we're part of. Um, so the chances of, of doctorates from Ireland, for example, going on to be able to be reviewed by panelists who are coming out of these European programs means that some degree of international coordination in the European community is essential. Um, on the other hand, there is also a national level conversation which is quite distinctive based on the institutional parameters of universities, of how art is funded, how art is practiced, and all of those distinctions. So um, in the role that, that for example, uh, both Jules and I are part of here with IMBUS, um, which I think will have its own session uh, later on in, in, the, in the seminar series, we are trying to be part of that national conversation as one of many organizations um, that have made that attempt or, or who are kind of connecting uh, a dialogue about that. So the idea of a national collaboration um, being the next level is, is, I think, really indicated by, by what, uh, what Professor Schiller is speaking about. Um, and then finally, um, the conversations internally at universities. There's been a lot of lip service paid to interdisciplinarity and coordination over the years internally within institutions. But to see the artistic doctorate as a kind of lever that could change some of these institutional um, constraints in different, in different capacities is something that seems to emerge from the way that that's happening at Grenoble, that, that the, the conversations where interdisciplinarity has not historically been a central focus um, is starting to break down and make some of those borders more, more porous. And that, that itself is a contribution to the university's knowledge, not just in the service of the artistic doctorates, but of the whole institution, the whole science, the whole framework. So of the things that really jumped out at me, um, I, I have a couple bullet points here just to, um, to, to draw on then at the end. Um, the first is I was really stunned by her description of resources. So um, the resources that they were speaking about in Grenoble included space. So that was purpose built, uh, you know, a, a building that included purpose built studios for circus, dance, cinema, writing, and theater. Um, although music was not part of that there. I'm sure many of us at the Irish institutions would be looking with, um, with, with envy at that. There were resources of people um, under discussion. The hiring uh, at Grenoble seemed to prioritize artist scholars and scholar artists. Um, one of the ways, if we think that's very unlikely, particularly in the, in the post-pandemic context, if that's not a level of investment we can expect in Ireland, which I, I suspect is the case for now, um, then, then opening up avenues for working artists who are looking for employment to be part of supervision committees and create ways that these two communities can interact. In a very bureaucratic system of universities like France, um, there are a lot of certifications that you have to go through in order to be part of a supervision committee. And they seem to have resolved some ways with artistic doctorates to get working artists in so that that expertise is there, which enhances the whole discourse, the whole community. Um, the, uh, the, the other resource that they had, which I think is perhaps feasible here, is the resource, resource of small seed funding, you know, seed money with a focus on interdisciplinarity to run individual projects or you know, short projects over the years, these kinds of challenge grants. Um, of course, these, this will all work best if those three things happen in tandem. So um, those of you with a line on this call into government policy, um, this is something that advocacy and organization seems like it could really do. If you put resources into these three areas, that would make a huge lift um, compared to, uh, to the state of the art. So I, I was also encouraged at the end, um, just that there's so much still up for debate. Um, she spoke about the terms in, uh, in France uh, that, that they're using at Grenoble, recherche en création, um, others are recherche création, and that these, this kind of mirrors some of the terminological debates that have happened in the Anglosphere. 
um, but that some of the challenges that might happen in France around interdisciplinarity might actually be in a in a in a in a richer context in in the Irish tradition in terms of the way that the arts are collaborating or speaking with each other, and that in a small country we might have an advantage, even as art forms and institutions move at different speeds, um, of coordinating this. So I think one of the big questions going forward for this seminar series would be, what is the right amount of national integration and international integration in this space. Obviously, there's a danger of becoming too constricted um, where guidelines become sort of strictures and rules. But on the other hand, the utility of organizing as a community, um, publishing proposed good practice, drawing on this European context, you know, creating frameworks that draw on our existing strengths, but also push that boundary forward for Europe um, seems like, uh, if, if I can say, you know, a kind of no brainer. It's like something that we're really well placed to do. And, and so I was deeply encouraged um, by everything I heard um, from, from Professor Schiller, as well as um, all of the other sessions that my colleagues have mentioned. Thank you, Nick. Um, okay, thanks, Michael. Thank you for, to my colleagues. What we're going to do now is we're just going to have a few minutes where uh, the panel will come together just to uh, reflect on some of that. I did have quite a, a few summari summarizing things to say, but actually, Nick, you said most of that very well. And um, so I think I'm just going to open the session um, and also just bearing in mind that we've, we've not a huge amount of time. So again, I, um, one of the things that I find most heartening about this seminar series is that, um, well, firstly, that in a time of, of, uh, of a great challenge in the arts, that this has been a kind of continuity that has been a genuine pleasure for many of us. Um, and I also really appreciate having uh, the different disciplines side by side. And I really appreciated the way that Gretchen Schiller spoke about the different disciplinary um, traditions and, um, and, uh, and, and prototypes that, that, that different disciplines have, and yet we share so much. And it feels like um, that it's somewhere in there, as you, as you articulately say, Nick, um, towards how much, how much do we take from previous uh, research and connection? How much do we take from our particular Irish context? And I think that's absolutely um, critical. Um, and, 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 and how do we advocate for us as, as a national um, body of people kind of working in these areas um, without closing things down, with, that, with, with it seeming so, like something that's enabling? So I wanted to open that to my colleagues if you wanted to come back on any of those um, points that have been raised or if you had anything kind of general um, to say about where we might go from here. Yvonne. I just wanted to say two brief things in response to that summary. Um, one is in response to Nick's um, point about finding a balance between uh, a national discourse and international discourse and thinking about what the national discourse has to offer the international discourse. Um, uh, because uh, I think it is really critical not to lose sight of the fact that um, most countries are small countries, most countries aren't big countries, and most of students doing PhDs in small countries aren't going to be able to find at least a first job inside their country of origin. People move around. So enabling students to show off the unique qualities of what they're a country of study at PhD level is able to offer to the wider uh, constellation of artistic research is also a way of ensuring that their job opportunities internationally are as large as possible when they finish PhD. And I think that's a really critical and interesting dialogue to follow. Um, the second thing I wanted to say, just following up from um, Jenny, um, you made uh, I think our fields, dance and theater, have had so much to do with each other internationally in terms of how these various things, um, research creation, artistic research, par, have evolved. Um, and uh, I think you're really right to um, underline Vida's point that um, dance, what has happened in artistic research and dance has opened up methodological opportunities for other arts fields, but also for many non-arts fields. And one of the areas that um, uh, I think is really important to enter into the national dialogue with is having a, a big ego about what artistic research methods have to offer non-artistic disciplines. Um, because there's a lot of desperation for innovation in the hard and social sciences 
for with people who are working inside methodological strictures that a lot of the time they find destroy their own research creativity. And so I think there's also something we really have to say and empower uh, doctoral students to see themselves as not just um, uh, making a space for art inside universities, but actually transforming larger research culture inside universities, especially um, established research universities that play uh, um, the games of power and prestige that are aligned with hard science research prowess. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Yvonne. Um, I'm sorry, I actually forgot to say there are some questions coming, but if you have questions for the panel, please use the uh, Q&A um, item at the bottom or that we do have some questions in the chat as well. Jenny. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, just to follow up from what Yvonne was saying, um, you, I think we're kind of hitting that generational, there's a, there's a sense, as I was saying, there's, there's a kind of more uh, material uh, available to us now. Like when I was doing my PhD, um, it, it seemed very, I, 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 I had so, such a little, so very small idea about even um, research methodology. And I mean, I think I was kind of cosseted through that process by a really supportive supervisory team that didn't, you know, it was only afterwards when I, I was in Australia for a number of years and that, um, that I really started to understand about the potential within that. But, um, and, and I suppose I've encountered in, in, in kind of recent years as well, lots of great resources, like uh, I have a colleague in a University of Auckland, Alice Longley, who's created this um, series of cards called Smudge Skittle, which are just wonderful kind of, you know, um, I, we use it with, with students all the time or the somatic toolkit. So I feel like we're really kind of getting to a point where we have something more material to play with. And I think that, that as you say, can then be, you know, um, offered to other disciplines, but, but certainly can support this, this, this kind of movement forward. No, I, re um, I just before I, I let Trina come in there, I, I think this is absolutely critical, actually. And I think that um, th that we are not very confident as disciplines. Uh, and, and what you say there, Yvonne, about um, having an ego about that and being trying to step into that sense to name the skills that we have and the strategies that we have and what we have to offer the kind of broader communities is really critical. Trina. Thanks, Jules. Um, just to, to respond to the, the larger question about, you know, uh, the national approach and the international approach and the European approach. Um, I think that, that um, it's important uh, in our national approach that we keep a sense of um, multiplicity in, 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 in how we approach things. And I think one area that we possibly have something really significant to offer um, uh, to the European context and something to add to, to that context is um, our engagement with um, art forms of minority communities and of minority languages. And I think that um, the Irish situation is interesting because the traditional arts are so prominent uh, nationally in Ireland, for example, and that's something that creates already that just extra diversity conceptually in how we might approach an artistic doctorate. Um, and Yvonne was speaking earlier about, um, about how conservative art can be, um, similar to how academia can be really conservative. Um, and this might be one element of, of conservatism that we possibly do find uh, in the arts is that um, sometimes because we're, we're demanding an intellectual rigor, that intellectual rigor often is expected to look a certain way. And I think in the Irish situation, we already have examples of um, artistic research and potentially much more examples of this in the future, whereby the artistic research looks different and has different requirements and the methodologies um, will be really generative in that sense. Um, because I think that there is often a tendency with, within both traditional writing-based scholarship and possibly in artistic research to go towards um, forms of expression that sit very well um, with, with the avant-garde, avant for example, or they sit very well with a particular take on experimentalism. However, in the Irish context, I think we have the opportunity to broaden what we mean by experimentalism, to actually embrace um, knowledges that are off the beaten track, um, knowledges that might not be very high in the hierarchy um, within more mainstream values within our own disciplines. And I think that I 
believe that the Irish context has something unique to offer, but that will resonate with many minority communities across Europe, for example. And that's something I'm particularly excited about in making sure that there is this this connection both that we are responding to the European and the international context and at the same time that we are genuinely representing that inherently generative space that artistic research really represents. Thank you Triana. Um, that's something that I've actually genuinely learned from you which is um, uh, that sense in which the traditional arts and especially the kind, some of the kinds of strategies that you bring and that your colleagues bring, um, that there's, an, there's, there's a resistance and a kind of reveling in that opposition between experimentalism and tradition, which is really, uh, really compelling. And I think speaks also to the importance of, um, of community and um, of, uh, of, of the non professionally trained expert artistic practitioner as well. Um, so I think that there are that, that combination of um, of both, uh, as, you, as you were mentioning, Yvonne, um, the, the kind of expert and the uh, and what happens in other kinds of contexts have potential to kind of collaborate on what we constitute as, a, as a radical or experimental. So um, I um, Will I pass over to Inesh? We, um, we, you're very quiet today, all you people there. Have you not got any questions for us? <laughs> um, uh, do please, if you have any questions or even thoughts or comments, do please um, uh, write in the Q&A uh, section. And meanwhile, I'll pass back to Inesh, who's uh, going to um, ask a question. Thank you, Joe. So yes, um, if any of you in the audience have any questions for the panel, please do keep them coming. I think one of the things I would like to ask, um, it's really interesting to discuss all these points uh, in terms of artistic research and how it is expanding. I think my question is how might that translate into training uh, in terms of um, enhancing the training, the support that we offer for candidates, for supervisors, for examiners. Are there any key points that came up throughout the seminar series that made you think, oh, we could experiment this, or we could experiment that, and how you might bring that into the field of dance, theater, music, um, and so on. If anyone of you would like to say something about that. Trina? Thank you. I was really struck by the idea of going beyond the mode of critique and supervision. This is something I wanted to touch upon um, from Vida Michelow. I thought that was really compelling. Uh, interestingly, it also mirrors um, a lot of work happening in um, the sociology critique uh, of critique and the, the sort of status anxiety of critique and getting into cycles of critique. And so I found that really compelling. But as a supervisor, it's interesting to think of having a participatory role or almost an immersive role rather than what we're more used to, which is we respond, uh, we, we correct uh, and we critique. So it's actually um, challenging how we, we view that relationship in profound ways. Maybe that doesn't address the issue of, of structure um, uh, so much, but I think that that relationship, even in traditional doctor researches is, is the, the cornerstone of how everything develops. And I think that that's something that, that I just found really striking. So I thought I'd mention it at this juncture and I'll leave it at that. Um, Yvonne, please. Um, uh, on the note of Vida, I, I have happened to have been at an event where she ran a sample um, methodological workshop in artistic research about two years ago, one of her more recent um, developments of that kind of work. And it was tasted by academics and PhD students and some MA students alike. And um, indeed, Trina uh, is super interesting how she manages to do in some ways things that uh, we might do in the arts, in the embodied arts anyway, teaching at undergraduate level often but actually bring those into a sophisticated space where workshop practices are used to raise questions. And I think, I don't think she used this term, but one of the interesting, she might have, but I, I don't remember whether um, I'm using it or whether I'm citing her, but um, 
you know, the really difficult challenge for an artistic research PhD student of allying um, passion and what makes them passionate about what they're doing with the notion of experimentation and um, without sucking the life out of it. And so that challenge of keeping the vitality and the life and the lived experience inside the dialogue is really something that can be, that right now is really unique to the way um, we can supervise in these fields inside the kinds of institutions we work in. And uh, it's really interesting to experience that and where different people are taking it. So, yeah. Inesh, we have one question. Yes, uh, we've got a question from the audience looking at um, what do we understand in terms of what is the criteria and how do we articulate differences between what is traditional and what might be seen as radical or experimental. So for example, are we talking about performance art in MoMA as experimental? So where are the limits between what we understand as traditional and as experimental? And uh, Rina, please. Yeah, what's really interesting about this, of course, is radical means going back to the root. So um, etymologically, you could argue that traditional and um, radical can actually be the same thing. And I think one of the things that can be overlooked, and this has been overlooked in traditional scholarship for years, is the inherent recreative impulse of traditional arts. So sometimes people think that which is traditional stays the same, whereas scholars in oral theory and in oral traditional arts all over the world would know that um, the conservation of these very old traditions, in fact, is constant recreation of those older traditions. So um, for me, um, I suppose there's two things I'd say about it. I think that experimentalism can be an identity um, that's closely aligned to a sense of fluidity and modern subjectivity. Um, and with traditional art forms, sometimes the inherent uh, creativity and generative spark within um, those traditions sometimes aren't easily visible uh, to people who maybe have a different identity. So what's interesting in Ireland, for example, is that you'd have people maybe under the age of 20 who have, as, as Jews alluded to, um, they have incredibly sophisticated art forms. Maybe none of them were formally taught because um, they were developed through sophisticated um, cognitive processes through immersion. Um, and they're living in, in a really contemporary world. And yet they also embody an aesthetic that's really resonant. So it's that, I suppose, what John Miles Foley would call the echoic quality of traditional arts that you seem to echo with many other performers or many other moments. Um, so I think that there can both be a sense of tension, as in often, um, you know, even anecdotally, you'll come across people who have a sense of tradition, tradition that's old, get rid of it, it's a problem we have. Um, but then there are others who kind of see almost like a postmodern moment in engaging in, in very traditional aesthetics. So I think it's both a tension and in an, in a, in a, how do you say, a counterintuitive way, absolutely connected um, in a circle as well that the experimentalism already exists in the tradition. I don't know if that answers it. Thank you. Oh, uh, we've got one more comment from Jenny and then I'll ask the next question. Jenny, please. Yeah, no, just to add to that as well, because we have a number of students in the Irish World Academy who are, who are exploring arts practice through traditional, um, in tr traditional forms. And I suppose the, another huge value in that is the insider knowledge, the embodied knowledge of that, even in itself, you know, to be able to, um, so of course the work might be breaking boundaries within the form, but it also is another layer of innovation is really how we might look at it from another perspective, or we might see particular kind of structures or patterns within the, the practice of the art form itself that, um, that, you know, I suppose, again, just to highlight the value of the artistic researcher as the insider researcher with that embodied knowledge. Thank you, Jenny. We've got a question about um, if we could say more about the specific specific differences in the regulation across universities and how these differences shape what is possible for candidates. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about that and then pass over to my colleagues as I've been doing some research across regulation. And what I've found across 
uh, different institutions in Ireland. It's actually quite a myriad approach. On one hand, in Ireland, there are some very structured PhDs which are uh, kind of following the more American models of having uh, classes in the first and second year, um, having credits and having to uh, respond to specific assessment before uh, moving on to the writing and the practice. Whereas other uh, universities are following more open models, more uh, perhaps um, related with the Anglo-British approach of uh, focusing more into the research, into the connection with the supervisor, the discussions through supervision, rather than having a set block of classes to follow through throughout the years. Um, PhDs are mostly uh, in between uh, three, uh, three to four years structure or unstructured, and there seems to be varying degrees in terms terms of the aims of the project and the learning outcomes and various degrees in terms of what is the role of and the function of the practical element, um, whether the work embodies the contribution to knowledge or not, whether the practice might be understood in different ways. And also differences in terms of the examination of the practice that sometimes takes place either a year or six months beforehand and whether the examiners do see a textual um, background with the practice before actually examining the thesis or whether that process of examining the thesis and the writing takes place together in the same moment in time. So there are quite a lot of varieties uh, in terms of uh, the regulations across Ireland and I'm going to pass over to the panel and Jules would you like to say something about that? Yes, um, I, um, I wanted to say that um, some, one of the things that this research project is doing is actually, um, and Inesh has led on this, um, is actually trying to collate all of the different kinds of regu regulations um, and we're in the process of, of kind of reflecting on those with the different institutions and we hope um, at some point to be able to kind of share that within Ireland because those, that kind of information about what are we all doing and how is it different and how, and it's not about um, proposing a, a value judgment about one process being better than another um, but more about um, sharing that understanding about what the different practices are um, and we also hope to um, well we don't hope we will develop open source educational resources towards the end of this research project which will map some of these differences and the kinds of questions that come up through um, supervision through um, examination and um, and all of the other kind of processes that happen within um, within the process of an artistic research PhD. So I'm just conscious we're very close to 11 o'clock now. Um, and I just wanted to reference um, in the chat the comment from Vida Migelo, who presented on Tuesday this week about um, something that Yvonne once said to her about putting the heart back into research. And I think this is <laughs> absolutely critical that we remember that it's about um, that in terms of being connected and caring and passionate about what we do that this is uh, what drives us both as artists as research and as, as a supervisors and as students and that we need to uh, make spaces and and advocate and uh, develop processes so that that doesn't become crushed as has as has been said um, we also have um, on that uh, note in um, in september we have um, presentations from PhD students. We have a good few applications in at the moment, but we'd very much welcome any more. Um, any of my colleagues, if you have PhD students who might be interested in presenting on their work, um, we've had two sessions in which that will happen. Um, we'd very much welcome and the link that is there in the chat. So um, without further ado, I'd like to thank my colleagues and particularly um, Triana, uh, Kira, Yvonne, Nick and um, Jenny, as well as uh, Inesh, and also Michael Ryan, who's behind the scenes here, helping us uh, do all of this technically. So do please join us next week um, on Thursday at 11 a.m., where we have a session which is specifically focused on um, supervising artistic research PhDs, and we hope to connect to a European um, uh, research project which has been looking specifically at this for a number of years. Um, so this is something that's close to all of our hearts. So do please join us if you can. And if you can't, um, all of these sessions are recorded um, on our website. So thanks everyone and I look forward to seeing you next week.
Bye-bye.